we, we've said since the start we're here because we believe in the opportunities for AGL as a combined entity are uh, greater than that as a demerged entity. So obviously very happy with the, uh, the board's announcement today. AGL has been adamant that the demerger would go ahead up until as late as Friday. What do you think changed? What led to this decision? Was it the shareholder pressure led by your campaign, a new Labor government? What do you think? Uh, look, we'll have to see in time, but my guess is all of the above. Uh, certainly the uh, the new government with the, the Labor Party's plans makes the demerger maths very hard to see how it makes any sense. Um, we would argue it, it didn't make a lot of sense anyway in the first place. Uh, I, I know the company can do the maths the same way we can. And, um, you know, they had a huge number of institutions had now come out for support, both publicly and privately, to say they were going to vote against it, not, not just us, uh, most of the major shareholders. And the retail math that we were seeing was running, you know, probably two to one against them. And uh, it, it would have been, you know, I think a, a huge result in the quite emphatic in the opposite direction and um, I'm sure they could they could see that result as well. We know that the company is now taking a strategic review of its operations. What specific action do you want the company to take immediately and then later down the track in the medium and longer term? Look we've been very clear we think uh, you know the first step here uh, was the demerger proposal which is is off the table. Uh, I think as a as a referendum on the board, that leads to the second step, which is this is the same board that's been around for uh, you know five plus years and and has uh, overseen the destruction of a huge amount of shareholder uh, value, uh, and we want to see that restored. We want to see that grow. Um, that requires you know board renewal, which we've seen already today. Uh, quite a lot of the directors um, saying, right, we get it. That's what the shareholders want, and um, and they've spoken for that. So the next step is to uh, to rebuild the board uh, with the skills, talent, you know, encourage to take this company through the, the transition ahead and, and benefit from all those opportunities. That's certainly what we would like to see as a, as a very next step. You've indicated that you'd like uh, two board seats, but we know four will be vacated out of the possible eight. Uh, what would you like to see in the makeup of that board? How many seats might you like? Look, I think the most important thing is the skills that they bring, right, and, and the belief. I think this, you know, this transition is obviously going to require a lot of skills in terms of uh, the energy industry, a lot of skills in terms of corporate transition and just large scale uh, overhaul of, of a very proud company with a, with a great history and, and setting it up for uh, a great future uh, in the decades ahead. Um, it's a technology change, so uh, uh, technology skills um, and, you know, and, and ambition and courage. I think uh, uh, leaning into these opportunities, you know, is going to take work. There's no doubt about it. It's going to take uh, uh, some amount of, of courage and optimism in terms of how that flows forward. Uh, and we would hope to see that in the in the directors who are really willing to um, to attack those opportunities and go after them with uh, what what should be a company that can benefit greatly from uh, from that transition. The AGL board has said that it believes the closure of its Bayswater power station in 2035 and Loy Yang power station in 2045 would continue to be accelerated. How soon do you want to see these closed? Look, I think the important part here is. Uh, when uh, do those assets cease to be profitable for the company, um, which is probably significantly faster than those 2035 and 2045 dates, i.e. they start losing significant amounts of money. Um, they're also generating very expensive energy and they're unreliable and they continue to break down more and more frequently. Um, so that, that transition needs to be proactive, it needs to be managed, uh, it needs to be very carefully planned um, and it needs to make sure that we are continuing to provide the lowest price powers to uh, the the customers of the of the company, uh, I think we can do that significantly faster than than those dates for sure. Uh, I think the the energy market and everybody else believe that, that is also possible. Uh, and now it's a question of the company having uh, having a Paris line plan and, and showing that that is possible. Is there a risk, Mike, though, of pushing energy prices up in the short term if those coal fire stations are brought offline too soon? Uh, if if replacement supply is not available and those projects don't come online, sure. I believe there'll be significant replacement supply uh, available and certainly the more certainty we can give, we saw with Liddell, uh, the faster that replacement supply comes online in terms of renewables with firming and storage and all the other bits and pieces that are required. The, uh, the prices that people are seeing now that are very high are high for two reasons. One is the price of coal and gas is at all-time highs uh, and fossil fuel-based energy gets more expensive as the fuel gets more expensive. So that's the first reason. 
Secondly, those plants are very unreliable. We saw uh, quite a lot, 30 to 40% of um, New South Wales and Victoria's power supply is offline from fossil fuel-based generators at the moment. And that's a significant problem because these are very old assets that are very hard to run and, and run reliably. As the grid gets more renewable, they become more and more unreliable. So if we want to bring prices down, yes, I think that transition is uh, is the fastest way to do it. The cost to making that grid more renewable, though, is quite a substantial one as well. $10 billion for a new transmission line in the near term to handle that output of solar and winds, according to the energy market operator. So I guess the question is, you know, what are the economics of when you're, when you're weighing up coal-fired generation versus renewables? And, and can you guarantee that perhaps the plan or the vision that you might have for AGL will not see consumers paying more for energy? Firstly, in terms of the cost, uh, I think we have to be clear that this is an investment, right? Renewable assets in general, be their transmission or generation, have an upfront cost, but save a lot of money over the long term, and hence they're incredibly financeable. So yes, the, the numbers that you're quoted, $10 billion, whatever it is, sound like a lot of money up front. However, they will save consumers significant amounts of money and they are eminently financeable over a long period of time. So uh, as an investment, it brings people's power bills down. Um, there's no doubt that a renewable grid, uh, if we were 100% renewably powered uh, by say 2030, which is uh, I believe significantly achievable target, um, would have much lower power prices for consumers than if we have a fossil fuel powered grid. Um, and we can see that today. 30 odd percent of our grid is renewables today. If it wasn't for that 30%, your bill would be significantly higher than it is right now because of the price of, of coal and gas right now being, being very high. So mm. um, we will certainly have a lower price than we would otherwise have had. And is storage pretty critical to all of this playing out, given that you need to store the hydro energy, the wind, the solar to be able to feed it back into the grid? Well, hydro energy doesn't need to be stored because you can run at any time of the day or night. Um, for solar and wind, you certainly need to time shift it a little bit at different times. Um, storage is one way to do that. There are many other ways to do that as well. Uh, we talk about distribution, so having assets in lots of different places around the grid. Uh, renewable technologies are very much more demo uh, democratic. They can be built in a lot of different places. You don't have to have a coal mine to build one. Um, that is what creates huge amounts of jobs all over regional uh, Australia uh, as a result of this. Um, you can also do things like demand management um, and then various other uh, techniques. Uh, electric vehicles play a huge part in balancing the load. Mm. Uh, what you need to do is match supply and demand. And uh, we have a lot of techniques and technologies to do that. Okay. On to financing. Uh, Mike, are you concerned at all that this the failure to demerge will raise any financing issues for AGL? Do you expect the banks will still support the integrated company, which is the country's biggest emitter of uh, carbon dioxide? Uh, look, we've said since the start, the most important thing, and, and uh, the majority of shareholders agree with us, uh, as you saw last year, uh, you know, the company had the largest contested uh, motion ever in an Australian AGM, in Australian corporate history, when 53% of the shareholders at the AGM last year voted for a Paris aligned plan against the recommendations of, of the current and then board. Uh, the shareholders want a Paris aligned plan and they don't want it uh, because they're, they're sort of bleeding heart greenies. They want it because a Paris line plan is the most economic thing for the company. Um, having that will unlock uh, uh, financing and also have a lower cost of capital for the company uh, as ESG investors will, will come back to the company as will banks and other companies who lend money. So the first step is border renewal. The second step is a, a clearly Paris line plan that meets the science uh, uh, targets because that will unlock uh, financing at a lower cost of capital. So th that has to be done for sure. Your motive, it's been reported, behind blocking the demerger has been questioned. And I'll quote Morningstar. They said that a sceptic might think that this was a ruthless plan to force the AGL Energy Board to accept a low-ball takeover offer. The share price has been around, uh, down around 2% today. Is there any merit in that idea, pushing the share price lower, making it a cheaper takeover target? Uh, absolutely none. As a larger shareholder in the business, that would be a pretty silly thing to do. Um, Look, there's been a lot of FUD thrown around about our motivations and every time people ask us, we're very clear. Uh, we'll continue to be clear. We've done everything we said we were going to go do. Um, people said we wouldn't actually have the shareholding. We have the shareholding. We wouldn't actually put up the cash. We put up the cash. Um, other shareholders wouldn't agree with us. Other shareholders actually do agree with us. So we continue to believe the opportunities for this company are very large. That is why we are here. Um, that is a higher share price than today. 
Uh, we put $650 million on the table uh, in investment towards doing that. Um, we've said that we clearly want a Paris line plan. We believe that's the best outcome as a shareholder. Uh, we've said we want board renewal as a shareholder and as the largest shareholder, we believe we have, have some say in that, um, in, you know, in proportion to our stake and other shareholders as well. Um, we're doing the things that we said we were going to go do. We've said what we're going to do for three weeks and uh, every single time we've we've done what we said. So we'll continue to do that. Can you rule out uh, another takeover tilt in the future? Uh, it certainly hasn't been anything that we've spent any time on any activity to do that. Um, no one can know what can happen in the future in any real sense, but it's not something that we're spending any amount of calories on at the moment, no. We, we're entirely focused on the demerger and then the board renewal and, and, and rebuilding the company. And just finally, Mike, you know, your tweet um, this morning was a fairly elated Mike Cannon-Brooks uh, saying that there's still a lot, of work, a lot of work to do. How did it feel for you today? What is the sense of, of what you've achieved here? Look, I think it's a big team effort. I think that's the most important thing. Um, I it was, it was a bit surprising, to be honest. I dropped my kids at school and I often, on Monday mornings, you know, um, clear my head for the week with a bit of a bushwalk down here. And so I was in the middle of <laughs> the Australian countryside when uh, when it all sort of, my phone lit up and it started coming through. And look, it's a credit to the, the big team we've had working on this, but not only that, other shareholders. Retail shareholders have come out in huge numbers to express their views. Um, other institutional shareholders who've listened and been very thoughtful and expressed their views. So, um, you know, it's a win for corporate democracy in this particular case and, and hopefully for um, people voting for the opportunities of decarbonisation for Australia. And this is a company that should benefit the most from that decarbonisation. So, um, look, pretty happy of people seeing that and under no illusions about the amount of work ahead and, um, you know, keen to get into it. And just briefly before I do let you go, you're keen to get into it about the work ahead. When will you be engaging uh, with AGL and when can shareholders and Australians hear more about the direction of the company? Uh, we've already been engaging with them today and um, I'm sure we'll have more meetings during the week. Um, look, the time is now. Mike Cannon-Brooks, thanks so much for joining us on The Business. Thank you for having me.